is brought to you by Head Start Basketball. Each of those blocks has principles and ideas that they can learn that will help them do a much better job of managing and guiding and, and directing their own behavior, let alone having the responsibility for shaping the behavior of others. Lynn Guerin serves as the CEO of the John R. Wooden Course and the president and head coach of his family-owned coaching, training, and performance development firm, Guerin Marketing Services in Temecula, California. Guerin has worked nationally and internationally with some of America's most successful companies, including IBM, Toyota, Mercedes-Benz, Infinity, Nissan, Acura, Hyundai Motor America, Kia, Chick-fil-A, In-N-Out, General Motors, and Nestle Purina, among others. For the past 20 years, Mr. Guerin has had the unique privilege of partnering with an American treasure, legendary UCLA basketball coach John R. Wooden and his family, in the conception, design, development, and delivery of the John R. Wooden course, timeless wisdom for personal and team success a curriculum composed of four comprehensive courses, Foundations and Fundamentals, The Pyramid of Success, Head Coach, and Extraordinary Teams. The curriculum is the centerpiece in Mr. Guerin's highly successful consulting and coaching practice, helping organizations develop extraordinary teams and coaching culture, and transforming managers into effective head coaches and leaders. This practice also includes a five-day John R. Wooden course professional certification process and event to train and prepare professional coaching practitioners, educators, and executives to learn, teach, speak on, and apply wooden principles, including the pyramid of success. Hey, Hoopheads, I wanted to take a minute to shout out our partners and friends at Dr. Dish Basketball. Their Dr. Dish shooting machines are undoubtedly the most advanced and user-friendly machines on the market. Learn more at drdishbasketball.com and follow their incredible content at Dr. Dish B-Ball on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Mention the Hoopheads podcast and save an extra $300 on the Dr. Dish Rebel, All-Star, and CT models. Visit drdishbasketball.com for details. That's a great deal, Hoopheads. Get your Dr. Dish shooting machine today. Hi, this is Adam Sestaro, boys head varsity basketball coach at Highland High School in Medina, Ohio, and you're listening to the Hoop Heads Podcast. If you're looking to improve your coaching, please consider joining the Hoop Heads Mentorship Program. We believe that having a mentor is the best way to maximize your potential and become a transformational coach. By matching you up with one of our experienced mentors, you'll develop a one-on-one -on -one relationship that will help your coaching, your team, your program, and your mindset. The Hoopheads Mentorship Program delivers mentoring services to basketball coaches at all levels through our team of experienced head coaches. Find out more at hoopheadspod.com or shoot me an email directly, mike at hoopheadspod.com. Follow us on social media at hoopheadspod on Twitter and Instagram, and be sure to check out the Hoopheads Podcast Network for more great basketball content. Prepare like the pros with the all-new Fast Draw and Fast Scout. FastDraw has been the number one play diagramming software for coaches for years. You'll quickly see why Fast Model Sports has the most compelling and intuitive basketball software out there. For a limited time, Fast Model is offering Hoopheads listeners 15% off FastDraw and Fast Scout. Just use the code HHP15 at checkout to grab your discount, and you'll be on your way to more efficient game prep and improved communication with your team. Fast Model also has new coaching content every week on its blog, plus play and drill diagrams on its play bank. Check out the links in the show notes for more. Fast Model Sports is the best in basketball. You'll want to take some notes as you listen to this episode with Lynn Guerin, CEO of the John R. Wooden Course. Hello and welcome to the Hoop Heads Podcast. It's Mike Cleansing here with my co-host Jason Sunkel tonight. And we are very pleased to be joined by Lynn Guerin from the John R. Wooden Course. We are going to dive into with Lynn tonight some of the wisdom of Coach Wooden. And I'm sure that most of you who are out there listening are well aware of the impact that Coach Wooden has had on the coaching profession. But I think you're going to be very pleased and educated by this opportunity to listen to Lynn 
speak tonight. Lynn, welcome to the Hoopheads Pod. Mike, uh, great to be with you uh, tonight. Delighted to be able to share uh, a, a long road of experience working directly with uh, Coach Wooden and, and thinking about all things Coach Wooden day and night for a lot of years. All right, well, let's start by going back in time. Just tell us a little bit about your background as in athletics, your background as it relates to Coach Wooden and how the two of you eventually came together and how that relationship evolved? Um, great question, Mike. I grew up in a, a small town in northern Ohio, right in the uh, the center of the state. Uh, Shelby, Ohio, our probably claim to fame athletically, the best athlete that ever came out of our, our little town was a guy named Larry Siegfried uh, that played college basketball with Bobby Knight and Jerry Lucas. And he was my high school hero. And uh, I played four sports at the uh, Shelby and, and, uh, ended up going to uh, to college on a football scholarship to Western Michigan University uh, in Kalamazoo, Michigan. That was in the late 60s and early 70s and went to Western and got a bachelor's and master's degree. Uh, thought about teaching and, and, and coaching uh, was always on my mind, obviously in a sports crazy town uh, like we had, you know, 12,000 people surrounded by cornfields and uh, in, in all directions, uh, football crazy Friday. Uh, just a little sidebar, we played uh, just this past Friday, we played the last game uh, on a field called um, Skiles Field, and we've been playing football on that same field for 96 years in Shelby, Ohio, and now they have a brand new field that they're going to be playing on for the first time actually uh, this week. So the sense of sort of tradition and legacy and loyalty in sports you know, was something I, I grew up with and, you know, growing up as a other side of the tracks kid, uh, you know, sports was really my ticket, uh, came from a broken home, which there wasn't a lot of in the 50s and 60s, but uh, thought that a, a football scholarship might be the one way I could get to college and ultimately try to make something of myself and had an opportunity uh, to do that. Uh, a after college and, and the master's, uh, got a master's uh, and ended up going into business and worked for a couple of large companies, J and J, uh, Johnson and Johnson, um, and and worked for a General Electric Corporation, and then got into the consulting, training, and performance improvement world, which is a direct link uh, to um, our work now with uh, Coach Wooden. So very early in my uh, business career, I was involved in that whole idea of bridging the gap between performance and potential helping uh, people be their best or companies be their best or teams uh, be the best that they can be. So I think that's been part of my mindset for uh, a long, long time and uh, started my own business now some 28 uh, years ago. And it was in that process that I met uh, Coach Wooden and did a couple of very large corporate projects with him, actually helped to launch uh, the University of Toyota, the Japanese car company, was developing their own corporate university. And I got involved with Coach Wood and building some coaching programs uh, with them. Uh, worked with uh, Coach for a couple of years on projects like that. And then eventually took him the idea of creating the John R. Wooden course. Uh, you know, I, I was so enamored with who he was and what he represented and how he thought and just his physical presence of this icon of character and integrity and humility and grace. And when you were around uh, Coach Wooden, uh, you, you just, you always walked away thinking, man, I, I got to be a better man. I, I got to be a better person. I, I, I got to be a, a better husband. I, I, I've got, I, I got to be a better friend. How, how do you get what that guy's got? And how do I get a little more of it? And uh, I grew up without a dad. My dad left when I was very early, uh, when I was really young. I never saw him post three, four years old. So Coach Wooden kind of became the dad, the, gra the grandfather and the great grandfather I never had. And I absolutely clung on to every word he said and everything he taught. And, you know, he became my de facto mentor, if you will. And, and he and I worked closely together from 1994 till he passed away in 2010, uh, 
developing a curriculum and tools and this idea of the course and then obviously trying to launch it uh, in a public marketplace, uh, working with uh, coaches and working with corporations and, and things like that. So, and then of course, I've been studying John Wooden's Pyramid of Success for 25 years and think it represents one of the biggest ideas in the history of American culture. Still maybe one of the better kept ideas, but I think uh, John Wooden's Pyramid of Success is an answer to many, many of the problems that we have in our culture and in our schools and in our families today. Just this incredible template of high character, high competence behavior that John Wooden patterned his entire life after. All right, before we dive into some of the things that Wooden has said, done, the pyramid of success, how you've been able to incorporate those into the course, I just want to touch a little bit on the relationship piece of it between you and him to lay some more background. When you think about meeting Coach Wooden for the first time, and obviously you're aware of him and you know who he is and what he's all about, but what struck you the most about him? If you can think back to your first interaction or two with him, what was something that you just walked away going, wow, this guy, he has it, as you described, that you, <laughs> left, you left him wanting to be a better man. What, what was it about him that you remember that struck you? Well, I, I think a couple of things uh, come to mind. One, knowing the, the first couple of conversations I had with him was over the phone and uh, a, a little factoid there was John Wooden's phone number was listed. If you call information <laughs> and, and ask for coach, uh, if you ask for John Wooden in Encino, California, you would get his phone number. <laughs> and and so that in, that in itself what was a, to me what was, was kind of a major clue to who he was, how he thought about things, uh, and, and so on. And then the very first time I met him, he lived in this very humble two-bedroom condo in Encino. And to visit Coach Wooden, you actually uh, had to park uh, in, in a little parking lot below his condo, where the condominium complex was. And then he had to let you up uh, to his condo, the floor that he lived on, in a little elevator. So uh, he would come to the window, you would see him, he would push a, uh, push a little button, raise the gate to let you in the parking spot, and then he had to literally open the door uh, to let you in the elevator, and there he stood for the very first time, and I guess when I first met Coach, he may have been in his mid-80s, I guess, this incredible icon of a man in this blue Arnie Palmer golf sweater with these incredible um, blue eyes and just this amazing grace. And I was thunderstruck. That's all I can say. <laughs> uh, and and it, it literally, you know, took you up to, to the condo and took you into his den and you sat down and you had a chance to talk. And uh, I, I, I took a number of people up to meet him, uh, people that often in his presence literally couldn't even compose themselves. I mean, literally had to leave the room. <laughs> They were so impacted by the what appeared to be almost aura of the man. You sort of he was, I don't know, half Jesus, half Yoda, half uh, you know. He, he just had this incredible peace and grace and strength and presence and humility about him that was just uh, you, you just can't describe it. And he, he also had the ability to just. He had this laser focus, this sense of presence that made you feel like you were the only person on planet Earth with him. And he was incredibly interested in who you were and everything you had to say. His ability to give attention at a level that I had never, ever experienced before. And say, I mean, it, was, it was overwhelming is really what it was. I think when you start talking about that ability to, and I've heard this be mentioned with other people who are extremely charismatic and have that same sort of aura like you described where they can have this conversation with you. And even though they may have never met you, that they make you feel like you are the only person that's there, that you are the most important 
person in the room. You are the most important person that's right there in front of them. And I think that Coach Wooden and other people who have that aura, I think that's a skill that when you're talking about things that it would be great for other people to be able to develop. And you think about that ability to listen and make someone feel that way. That's certainly a completely unique skill that not a lot of people have been able to master. As you're building this relationship with Coach Wooden and you're getting closer to him and you start to develop this business relationship with him where the two of you are working side by side with various companies, what did that process look like for you initially as you were as you were working with him what did uh, what did those conversations sound like what did the two of you talk about as you're saying okay we're going to go and and we're going to work with toyota what does that what does that look like what do those conversations sound like well uh, coach was you know was a master at at asking uh, the right questions he he you know he had such a he had such a sharp mind and such uh, an intellect and such a sense of organization in the way he thought about things. I mean, I think the part of the brilliance that made him the amazing coach he was, was how disciplined he was mentally, physically, morally, psychologically. I mean, the man was just absolutely under control. Um, and and th- that had that it was remarkable at the level at which which he did that so uh you know he 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 could always had this laser focus in terms of you know what we're going to be doing and you know what the reasons we were doing it and the things that we hope to be able to accomplish and um uh, always wanting to know you know what what the important things that that i thought uh that you know he could be bringing to whatever situation we were doing um you know whether whether it was uh, you know we're in we're in a setting where he's being uh with toyota we started out doing a series of video interviews uh just asking questions about coaching what it meant to be a coach uh you know what are how does a coach think about things how does a coach organize his work uh you know what's a coach's orientation to to people and how does he really see teams and all, all of them the fundamentals that he knew at such an incredible uh, level of depth and uh, his perspective on those things. I think one of the powerful phrases that he often used was this was this phrase, a proper perspective on things. You know, the idea <laughs> that th- that idea of common sense that isn't so common and that few people seem to have. He just had an incredible perspective on how to see things, how to think about things how to deal with people, treat people. And, and those were the things that were always, you know, coming across. And, and then when you got into the specifics of the wisdom that he had, he was incredibly well read. You know, he, he was writing and, and reading and memorizing poetry into his late 90s, still reading the works of the masters. He read his Bible every day. Uh, the man never stopped learning. It's I think it's one of the reasons that at age uh, 99, it didn't appear that he'd lost any mental faculties whatsoever. He could still give you, you know, 24 lines from Byron Shelley or Keats or, or quote, Grantland Rice or, or Shakespeare or something else, speak to a group of thousands of people with no notes and for 50 minutes, you know, just be this incredibly articulate person. I mean, it, 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 he was pretty amazing his mental uh, capabilities. But again, all of that surrounded by that such strong inner core that he had. He, I think there was just, a, I, I, I don't know how to describe it, but you just felt like he had a very pure inner core, his values and his principles and who he was spiritually and emotionally. Um, you, you never stopped wanting to listen and, and, and just being around him, hoping a little bit of that might brush off on you. I'm guessing that that core that you're speaking of is when you started thinking about and trying to talk with Coach Wooden about putting together this course, that it's applicable, and I'm sure you experienced it when you worked with him in the business world, but his 
success, that core of what made him who he was, the pyramid of success, all the things that he was able to do and the type of person that he was and being a lifelong learner. His success, I'm sure, could have translated into whatever field or occupation that he would have chosen. He just happened to choose basketball and to be a basketball coach. And I'm sure if he would have went another direction, he could have had just as much success, if not more, in, in other areas. And so I think as as I'm thinking about this and I'm thinking about the two of you working together and working with businesses and then this idea sort of generating itself of, hey, we should come up with a course that is going to teach the principles of what Coach Wooden was all about. To me, when I when I hear that, what I think of is that obviously Wooden is most famous within the world of basketball, but the things that he's done, the things that he's shared, the things that he's taught, the lessons that are a part of his life are things that are applicable across many different spectrums of our society. And we can talk about some as we get more into the course, but just as you were thinking about this idea and talking with him about putting his legacy into this course, were those sort of the discussions that, hey, the things that are important to him in his life and the things that he shared throughout his life, they can impact people in all different aspects of the world. That, that It's not just confined to sports or it's not even just confined to business. There's so many ways that these things can be applicable. Was that sort of the discussion as you started to work on the early origins of the course? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, this idea that uh, with Coach, everything was from the inside out. And, and because of the way he was raised and the way he grew up, everything became a process of building from a really strong uh, inner core. You know, uh, the, the Hall of Fame broadcaster, uh, Dick Enberg, uh, when he stood up at Coach Wooden's memorial uh, service and described this man that he loved and that he was really close friends with, uh, described him with a phrase that said, John Wooden's greatness was only exceeded by his goodness. And uh, what a powerful framework for thinking what life really should be all about. Um, so when we, uh, when I started to ask, I literally, we started working on the course and outline for the course, really uh, just uh, asking coach a couple of very simple questions uh, that he uh, began to answer and that started to sort of in our, our minds began to frame what the course ought to look like. And, and those questions were pretty simple. You know, Coach, how did your life become your life? How, how did it unfold like, like it did? And how were you able to accomplish what you accomplished in your life? Those, quest, those two questions were really kind of where we started. And, and he began to give an explanation of that that became literally the outline for the course. He, he started by describing uh, the values that were instilled by his parents that he thought ultimately guided the development of his principles. And, and very simple but, but powerful things, uh, like his, his dad telling him, never try to be better than someone else, but never cease to be the best that you can be. One is under your control, the other isn't. Um, the very simple values like his two sets of threes, you know, when it came to honesty, don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal. When it came to adversity, don't whine, don't complain, uh, don't make excuses. And then all of the things that were part of the process of him growing up and, and uh, that began to shape his character. And it was really from that inner core of values that his character was shaped and the character ultimately defined his behavior throughout the course of his life. And uh, in, in that process, it, it kind of led him on this journey, this sort of unique uh, steps he went through to begin to think about success. And, you know, he had his own definition of success. He spent a couple of years actually honing that and how that definition of success led him on this 14 year journey to try to describe 
uh, what it would take to achieve his definition of success um, as, as he defined it. So, you know, when, when Coach Wooden um, talked about success, he talked about it really from four perspectives. Uh, the idea that it was uh, his definition that success is peace of mind attained only through self-satisfaction and knowing you made the effort to do the best of which you're capable. Right away, you see that influence of his dad, the best of which you're capable. What is success? It's peace of mind. It comes from inside, self-satisfaction, and it's based on the effort you make at, uh, compared to the capability you have. And, and that definition was, was something he believed every human being has under their control. So that the shaping of the values, the development of the character, his definition of success, this identification of these qualities that he put on the pyramid of success, these 25 powerful ideas that all fit together. And, and he also had this really interesting perspective, uh, Mike, about experience. And um, the life experiences that really become your continual teacher you know, uh, the idea that there's no such thing as failure, right? Um, everything is really an opportunity to go through an experience uh, that can teach you something uh, and that you can learn from it and that you can and improve from. And, and then also he had a really interesting perspective, as he described it, coming out of experience on looking at results, right? Uh, all, all of these things that are ultimately produced in our life you know, he, he never got too high about the successes and he never got too low uh, regarding the challenges. And he had this sense of even keel in his life uh, with everything. I, I, you know, sometimes when you sit down, he, he'd share some things with you and he'd have this wonderful little twinkle in his eye. And you knew when that happened, he was about to say something <laughs> a absolutely profound. It was like this little thing lit up and, oh, oh man, I better pay attention. Here comes something amazing. And when he would talk about results, you know, things that happen in your life, you know, he'd say things like, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of good things that are going to happen in your life. And and people are going to say some nice things about you. And you're really going to like that. And uh, he'd say, you know, some of those things, uh, you know, they, they probably ought to be celebrated. But he said, you know, sometimes we get a little lucky, uh, too. Uh, he, he said, and then he'd say, you know, there's a lot of, there's going to be some bad things that are going to happen to you and, and people are going to be down on you at times and you're not going to like that at all. Uh, and, but then he'd say, you know, how you deal with both of those things and never getting too caught up on the, the, the things that you like and that are good or getting too down on the things that are bad or you don't like. It's that sense of perspective for the results in your life that will really keep you grounded and keep you moving forward. And, and then I, I think ultimately he ended that explanation that became the outline for our course around what he said were the two most important words in the English language. And those words were love and balance. And, and he said he, he tried to, uh, in his life, he tried to surround everything he did with love and balance. And man, that, that, that was uh, from his calendar to the game of basketball to every relationship he had and how he thought about things. So th this outline of uh, values and character and success and effort and experience and results and love and balance, he, uh, that became almost a sort of a, a bullseye perspective on, on what John Wooden explained to us about how his life turned out the way it did. And that literally became what I would describe almost the outline for a course. We, we ultimately ended up building four courses, one on foundations and fundamentals. Uh, we built one around the pyramid of success, all that behavior. We built a course called Head Coach, what it means to be a great coach of yourself and coach others. And then the idea of extraordinary teams. How does all that come together You know, to help people understand what it means to be a great teammate and how you can be a better leader of, of teams. Uh, and, and all of that was really, you know, the way he thought about his life and the way he lived his life. I think one of the things that is the most interesting about Coach Wooden, and you did a really good job of 
I think, pointing it out in several different ways is that he was really ahead of his time when it comes to thinking about the process rather than the outcome. Because I think we went through a period of time where, especially in the athletic world, where people were all about what's the outcome? Did we win or did we lose? And if we win, we're happy. And if we lost, we're unhappy. And clearly by Coach Wooden's definition of success, you could win and not be successful. And conversely, you could lose and be successful because it's about your process and you coming close to fulfilling what your own potential is, not necessarily basing it upon how you compete against someone else. And so much of what you hear today in the coaching profession is coaches talking about the process, that if we get the process right, if we're putting in the work every single day and we're doing the things that we're supposed to do to build our team culture, that the outcomes are going to take care of themselves. It's when we focus on the outcome that we end up putting too much pressure on ourselves or just going about doing things that maybe ethically or morally are not things that we would do if we weren't as concerned about the outcome. So I think in so many ways, Coach Wooden was way ahead of his time when it came to that focus on the process as opposed to just the outcome. Yeah, you know, Mike, I couldn't I couldn't agree with you more. And some of that, you know, when you were early on, when you were talking about the idea that Coach would have been probably very successful uh, in whatever he chose to do, uh, even if it didn't turn out to be a coach or teacher, you know, he went to Purdue to be a civil engineer. What, when I he, did, when know, I did, I did, I did know that. Yeah, when he left Martinsville, uh, he really went to Purdue and he picked Purdue because he wanted to be engineer. He, he wanted to build roads and bridges. And I, I thought there was a great irony in all of that because I think that's ultimately what he ended up doing his whole life, building roads and bridges. Uh, and, and he had this mind of, uh, of an engine. He had this incredible brain, this incredible right side, left side balance uh, of an engineer on the one side and a poet on the other. Uh, and, you know, when it came to, 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 you know, if you think about roads and bridges, I mean, he, he could see the end product uh, and, and, and he could see what that finished bridge might, might look like. And, but he also had the ability to break it down to every part it would take uh, to put that bridge together and also understand what it would take to construct it and to build it. And then, I, and then he also had the leadership abilities that once it once it got built, I think the lead people across it <laughs> to those <laughs> and and down those roads, uh, if you will, to to where people want to go in their life. I mean, that's how I thought about. It. So, and he ended up not not being able to be an engineer uh, because he had to work in the summertime to earn money. And to be an engineer at Purdue, you had to go to these summer engineering camps which he ended up not being able to do because he had to work. They, they weren't paid. He didn't get paid to go to those. And he ended up having to, uh, you know, to move out of the engineering curriculum and, and went into education. But that, that ability to engineer things and to understand things from a process standpoint was a very, very big part of the brilliance of, of John Wooden and, and, and spoke very much to who he was as a teacher. Right. He was a whole part, whole thinker. He had the ability to break things down into their smallest components and put them back together. You know, he, he had the ability to lead you from start to finish uh, and, and, and knew every step al along the way. Um, so, yeah, he, he was and, and he, you know, what he really loved was to teach and coach in the gym uh, during the week all week. And he felt, hey, when game time come, he'd done his work. The staff had done their work. Now it's an opportunity for the for the team to go out and do what they had been prepared to do uh, all, all, all week. Uh, that really was almost the crux, I think, of his of his locker room speeches. That was about the longest win one for the Gipper he ever gave. You know, his basic talk was, hey, we've done our job this week. You've done yours. You've worked hard. Now let's go out and do our best. I mean, that was about the longest pregame speech John Wood never gave. And again, that's the process, right? It's absolutely the, the, yeah. The prac the practices are 
the process and the game ultimately produces an outcome. But to your point, to the way that Coach Wooden coached, the way he approached it was my coaching, the majority of it is done during practice on the practice floor. It's not done during games. And if we've gone through the process right, then the outcome is going to take care of itself. And I think, like I said, he was way ahead of his time when it comes to that. One of the things that's always struck me, and just as you were talking about some of the things that Coach Wooden has done and said over the years, and you mentioned his father. And I know one of the, I don't even know if you call it necessarily a story, but I know one of the things that's always been interesting to me when it comes to Coach Wooden is you think about somebody who has been quoted as much as he is. And (laughs) most of us would be lucky to say one thing nearly as profound as all the things that he has that are going to be a part of our lexicon for a long, long, long time. But his father gave him, when he was a young kid, gave him a list of seven things that he should try to do. And I always go back to, and I think about as a parent, you hope that some of the things that you pass along to your kids can be impactful and and influence them in such a way that makes their life better. But I'm always struck by that little note that he gave to, uh, that John Wooden's father gave to him that he carried around with him. I believe he carried around in his wallet and just to me, his father is someone that I have to guess had a lot of similar traits to Coach Wooden that he was able to that he was able to pass along. So I'm curious in your conversations how much he referenced his father, and then I don't know if you want to share those seven things yeah. that Coach Wooden's father shared with him. But just how much did he talk about his father, and then maybe just share those seven things that his father said to him that or or shared with him on that on that note that that certainly influenced him greatly. Yeah, there's there's no question that the most influential person in John Wooden's life, uh, the person that shaped him most uh, in terms of how he thought and who he became uh, and who he was as a person was his dad, uh, beyond the shadow of a doubt. Um, and, and again, he, he, you know, his dad wasn't an educated man. He was a, was a poor farmer, had some very difficult circumstances. But Coach Wooden um, believed his dad was very, very intelligent. His dad was very well read. He began reading to the kids uh, by firelight, literally all the good books, and read to, read them uh, the Bible every night. And and so Coach felt you know had great respect for the intelligence uh, of his dad, and, and then even the person that he became and the way he exhibit, not only taught him these behaviors with things like the Seven Point Creed but became the role model for how that played out in life uh, and played out in a life under very difficult circumstances. The depression, uh, going bankrupt as a family, losing the family farm, uh, losing uh, two, two young daughters in childbirth. I mean, their family went through some incredible uh, challenges. You know, I think about our COVID world and think, well, you know, this isn't the first time people have gone through difficult things. And oh, by the way, there were pandemics and things back then too, uh, <laughs> and they didn't have nearly the kinds of things to uh, to cope uh, with those problems back then that we have now. But uh, you know, I think they were. I, I think a lot. I wonder, and I don't know anything about it. I wonder a lot about Joshua Wooden's father. You know, yeah. you know, the process by which strong men become strong men and the legacy of all that. John Wooden was who he was because of his dad. But how did Joshua Wooden get to be who he was? Right. I, I, I think about that uh, a lot. Um, so uh, Joshua, you know, and one, one of my favorite little Joshua Wooden stories is in a very important principle that Coach Wooden, uh, you know, uh, lived by. He tells a story of how his dad, uh, you know, they worked with a team of mules on the farm and they often had to go pull things out of difficult places. And he talked about uh, one time having to take a team of mules uh, 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 to pull a really heavy load out of a quarry. And, And coach was trying to do this, but he couldn't get the mules to do the work. 
uh, and uh, you know the, the the more upset he got, and he, he got a little heated, and he lost his temper, and he yelled, and he pulled, and you know did everything he could to get stubborn mules to do the work of pulling this big heavy load out of this quarry. <laughs> well, it, it, finally, his dad uh, just came down in the quarry where Coach Wooden was, took the reins uh, uh, of this team began to pet them a little bit, did some whispering in the ear, quieted them all down. And then coach said, and then just in a matter of minutes turned and just led them right out of the quarry. And uh, coach said from that day, he learned and tried to employ the lesson that there's nothing stronger than gentleness. And his dad exhibited, exhibited that in just the way he dealt and, and worked with and Coach Distinguished worked with versus handled, he felt that, that he saw his dad work with those mules, not handle those mules. Uh, it's interesting, that point came, came up in his life some years later with Will Chamberlain and, and the writing of a book. But a lesson like that that he learned is from his dad that there was nothing stronger than gentleness. Um, so the, the seven point creed, um, yeah, it, it's amazing that a father would have the perspective and the wisdom to think through something like this, to put it on a simple piece of paper and to hand it to his son and his boys. Uh, coaches, uh, brothers were also aware of this. And literally, John Wooden uh, referenced this almost every day of his life, his entire life. He spent his lifetime, honestly, trying to live up to dad's creed. Um, as a matter of fact, at, at Coach Wooden's memorial service, Keith Erickson was one of the featured speakers, actually, I think the closing speaker for Coach Wooden's memorial service. Keith's a very articulate guy, um, and a, a, a guy Coach Wooden described maybe the best athlete that Avery had played for him. And, and Keith racked his brain to try to come up with, to be able to say to this audience of eight to 10,000 people, what, what he believed would be the most meaningful thing he could share. And what, what he shared was the reference to the seven point creed and how Coach Wood literally tried to live to that creed every day of his life. And with tears streaming down his face, Keith shared with the audience that Coach your father would be very proud of the man that you've become. And he knew that he was lived that journey, basically trying to pay attention to the seven point creed and those key ideas of being true to yourself. That was the first one. Just be true to yourself, help others, make each day your masterpiece. And that had such a profound impact on coach's life. Everything about his coaching was designed to try to make every day the best it could. His organizational skills and his, his uh, sense of order uh, and, and the way in which he used very effectively every minute of the day, the two hours he practiced, never started late, never ran over. He was always trying to make each day his masterpiece and then trying to make the next day a little better than the one before. Uh, drink deeply from good books, especially the Bible. And that sounds like, oh, that was about reading or, you know, teaching your, your son to be. What that was really about was influencing his thinking. And the beginning of coaching, coaches, uh, coaching philosophy uh, and the five-part process that we teach in the course that a great coach, everything about a great coach starts with the quality of your thinking. Well, that was shaped by the seven point creed when his dad said, drink deeply from good books, especially the Bible. What he was saying was, son, you need to pay attention to everything that's going into your head and where are you gonna find the very best thinking? Well, you're gonna find it in good books. And oh, by the way, <laughs> Don't forget the, the good book. Um, <laughs> and, and then the fifth one was make, make friendship a fine, fine art. What that was about, that shaped how Coach viewed the importance of relationships and how important every relationship was, starting with your family. And of course, with him, starting ultimately with the, 
the loving relationship he had with his what his wife, which I think is one of the greatest love stories never told in our history and our culture. I'm hoping they're going to make a movie on it one of these days. Um, but that idea of uh, make friendship a fine art, never take it for granted. Uh, making friends is hard work. It takes work. You've got to invest in your friends. Uh, and, and the best time to have friends is before you need them. <laughs> that was a lot of wisdom his dad shared with him there. Absolutely. And then, and then the, the sixth one was build a shelter against a rainy day. And, and honestly, that had some real spiritual connotation because his dad was really talking talking to him about uh, he believed life after death. And you've got to live your life in a way that you've got an eternal perspective. And, you know, if, if you build your, your castles and your wealth here and have no perspective for what comes after life and the most important part after life, you, you're not going to be living your life in the way God intended you to. And then the last one was pray for guidance and give thanks uh, for your blessings each and every day. Well, that mindset of, of believing there, there's a higher power and, and there's always a better place to look for how you need to be guided. And there's values and principles that can help you be your best and to be thankful every day. And, and Coach, he, he was such, he had such a thankful perspective about him. You know, it's one of the reasons that, uh, you know, when we think about coaches today and the money they make, you know, John Wood never made more than $32,500 a year as a coach, but he was thankful for the contract every year, never tried to negotiate a higher salary, once turned down a couple offers to coach for a million dollars a year, the Lakers and the Pittsburgh Pirates, because money just wasn't that important to him. Um, I, I heard him say, you know, real uh, recently on kind of that perspective, he said, you know, the challenge today, a uh, coach is trying to teach their players to be humble and to be full of grace and things like that. He says, you know, when you're when you're putting on a three thousand dollar suit and you're jumping into a hundred thousand dollar car and driving away from your million dollar house to go shoot your TV show. He said, you know, it's a, it's a pretty hard it's pretty hard to be humble. What, when you've got those things going on in your life. So how do you teach humility and grace when, you know, is that really who you are and is that really represented by the lifestyle you're living and the things that seem to be very important to you? Uh, so that perspective of the seven point creed shaped John Wooden every day of his life right up to the final day of his life. I just think it's pretty incredible in terms of just the way it's phrased and you can read each one of those and clearly understand what his father meant. And yet there are so many different aspects to each one of those seven principles. It's just, again, incredibly profound, incredibly simple and yet incredibly profound. And, and the fact that not only did his father as a parent, take the time to create that but then John Wooden as a child as a son took that to heart and carried it with him and not only carried it with him but physically but actually you know internalized it and made it a part of who he was and I think that as a parent myself and to anyone out there who's part of the audience that's a parent if you could if you could somehow get your kids to internalize the lessons that you want to be able to 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 share with them. I don't think there's anything more powerful that you can do as a parent. And certainly John Wooden's father was able to do that with this seven point creed without without question. Your first impression is everything when applying for a new coaching job. A professional coaching portfolio is the tool that highlights your coaching achievements and philosophies. And most of all, helps separate you and your abilities from the other applicants. The Coaching Portfolio Guide is an instructional membership-based website that helps you develop a personalized portfolio. Each section of the Portfolio Guide provides detailed instructions on how to organize your portfolio in a professional manner. The guide also provides sample documents for each section of your portfolio that you can copy, modify, and add to your personal portfolio. As a Hoopheads Pod listener, you can get your Coaching Portfolio Guide for just $25. Visit coachingportfolioguide.com 
slash hoopheads to learn more. That seven point creed had a second part to it. There was a little poem uh, that he also gave uh, Coach Wooden at the same time, which uh, carries with it almost as 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 much uh, wisdom. It was a poem from a, a pastor named uh, Reverend Van Dyke, and it was very simply four things a man must do. And it went something like this: Four things a man must surely do if he would make his life more true: to think without confusion clearly, to love your fellow man sincerely to act from honest motives purely, to trust in God and heaven securely. Four things, think clearly, be a person of love, be honest and act from honest motives, and trust in, in a power that's higher than yourself. Uh, you know, so on one side, he had a seven point creed, on the other thing, he had the four things to do. That little piece of paper will get you through life. <laughs> <laughs> yes, if you could take that and live out those those principles, those ideas, you certainly could make your life pretty special. As you started putting this course together and you began to talk about it with Coach Wooden, and obviously it's evolved over time, what was your first intended audience? Who did you see the course being most valuable for? as you were first getting started and sort of laying out that outline that you talked about before? Did you envision it being for business leaders? Did you envision it for people in coaching? What was sort of the thought process? Or, or right from the beginning, did you think, hey, this is applicable in all different areas. We may have to tweak it to, to fit a particular audience, but it's really applicable across, across many different aspects of life. Yeah, I, I thought from from the beginning, Mike, that that Coach Wooden's teachings benefits every. If, if, if you're if you're breathing, <laughs> and you're up, <laughs> I wouldn't say if you're upright, but if you're if you're drawing a breath and you're trying to get through today and tomorrow, uh, John Wooden's life and John Wooden's wisdom can help you. And I still, twenty years later, I'm more convinced of that than than anything else. But the uh, the honest answer is, we launched the course. I mean, my, my background was in the consulting and training and performance improvement field and working primarily uh, in the in the business world and working with a lot of, you know, pretty large, uh, pretty large companies and, and fairly large audiences. So we, we tried to launch it literally with a one day seminar uh, launched in Southern California. Uh, we did one in Orange County and we did one in Pasadena. And that's literally how we tried to uh, to launch the course. Uh, it, it was with a, a one day seminar, but uh, ironically, uh, it didn't attract as many people as we hoped it would attract. Uh, they didn't seem to be willing to pay for uh, to pay for uh, the seminar. Uh, uh, the price, uh, I, we thought it was worth a lot more than people seemed to be willing to pay for it. And, you know, from day one, what, what I thought would be a slam dunk in terms of sharing this incredible wisdom in life wasn't as easy as, it, as I thought it would be when it came to turning it into a, a viable business. Uh, 20 years later, I still believe this. It hasn't discouraged me uh, <laughs> at all. I, I'm, I'm a, uh, it, I, you know, I, I've honestly felt, uh, you know, it's been my, uh, it's my life mission to do this. And I had this incredible privilege to meet him and to learn these things and to share them. And, and it was really part of a personal transformation in my own life, uh, getting through divorce and overcoming a lot of the things that I experienced as a child and growing up without a father. I mean, it was so much a part of my personal journey. Uh, and I knew if it was, you know, just working for an idiot like me, uh, the, impa <laughs> the impact it might have on people that actually had their heads on straight, you know. Um, so, uh, and I'll just share a, a, a quick story. I mean, we've always had some very strong confirmations from some very powerful places that we were always on the right course. Uh, I'll share just a really quick story. When we did the first seminar, uh, we had... Uh, Swen Nader came in, very much a part of the John Wooden story. We had uh, Craig Umpleman, his grandson-in-law, Andy Hill, one of his four, former players. We had a couple of other people teach. I did a lot of teaching, and of course, Coach Wooden spoke. 
And uh, th that, that day, uh, Mike, we wanted to find a really high powerful way to close the day, make it really impactful. And uh, uh, near Coach's uh, 90th birthday, uh, Swen Nader had written, uh, who was a, you know quite a, he was, had a pretty good voice and uh, liked to write poetry and songs. He actually wrote a parody to Bette Midler's The Wind Beneath My Wings. You know, did you ever know you were my hero with that song? Yep, and, I've, heard, and, I've, heard, I've heard Swen sing that song live. Yeah, well, uh, it's actually on, on YouTube too. So uh, we've had uh, Swen sing it a couple of times alive but the first time he sung it was at this uh at at the at the inaugural john earl wooden course and uh so that was how we were going to close the day and so swen when we came to close the day swen got up and sang that song uh to coach wood and i was sitting right beside coach at a round table of about 10 people and, and about oh i'd say three-fourths of the way through the song coach wooden leaned over to me and he said Hey, Lynn, when Swin gets done, would you have him sing a second song? <laughs> well, you know, this came absolutely out of the field. There wasn't anything we talked about. I had no idea what coach was about to ask, <laughs> what song he was going to request. We did, I didn't know whether Swin knew it. Uh, this was going to be an absolute curveball. And, you know, we played very well to orchestrate this thing right down to the final note. But, you know, I just gotten a signal from the bench from America's greatest coach, and I assumed I was supposed to do something with it, uh, not making excuses as to why Swen couldn't sing another song. And so I said, sure, coach, what do you want to hear? And he said, tell Swen to sing, his eye is on the sparrow. His eye is on the sparrow. Well, that happens to be, you know, an old Christian hymn, one of coach's very, very favorites, and a very powerful message in that hymn that says, you know, if God is looking out for the smallest of creatures like his sparrows, surely he's watching over us. It's a great, great message. And, and one is obviously one of Coach's favorites. So, uh, okay. So when Swen got, got done with that song and he got a thunderous applause and he was really proud of himself, <laughs> you know, for the job that he did. And Swen can only be what a wonderful man he is. And uh, so when the applause died down, I said, Swen, not so fast. Coach would like to hear another song. Now, his eyes, you know, he's six foot 11, 270 pounds. His eyes got absolutely huge. And now I could see on his face the same thought that went through my head. What's he want to hear? Am I going to know it? Am I, you know, and so he says, well, well what does coach want to hear? And I said, Swen, coach would like to hear his eye is on the sparrow. He gets this huge grin on his face, jumps up in the air about four foot, whirls his guitar around. He says, I know that one. I know that one. <laughs> so he proceeds to sing uh, the first verse and, and the chorus to his eye is on the sparrow. And as he's doing that, Mike, a small bird flies into the ballroom of this hotel room where these couple of hundred people are seated, literally flies around the room and people are seeing this and watching this and the bird literally goes over and hovers right over Coach Wooden as Swen is singing this song. Wow. And of course the people thought, Lynn, that was some producing job you did. Where did you get a bird so well trained? Right. But, you know, Mike, I had nothing nothing to do with that. No idea where it came from. After Swen finished, it flipped its wings, did one lap around and flew right out the window. Right out the right out the door. <laughs> and I knew from that day on, hey, this is something we're supposed to be working at. No matter what it takes, no matter what we got to go through, no matter who we're trying to reach and what it's going to take. So that was the confirmation of the mission of the John R. Wooden course from day one. And we've been working at it for 20 plus years. All right. So what I want to do now is talk a little bit about how the course can benefit 
some of the groups who may be a part of our audience. So let's start with a lot of our audience is made up of coaches. So yes. if I'm a coach and I'm considering taking the John Wooden course, what is it that I'm going to learn? How is it going to help me to be a better coach, be a better person? Just talk a little bit about from the coach's perspective, what are some of the things that a coach could expect to get out of the course? Well, I think if the coach went through the whole curriculum and we'd start the process actually with a very powerful assessment tool that we have that we built on Coach Wooden's Pyramid of Success, we actually can have a coach go through a 10-minute exercise, take a 100-question survey, and map his own, his or her own behavior on the Pyramid of Success, and then work on a 30-day playbook to understand how to apply those things to your life. So that that's the start of that perspective is, right? Uh, point one, be true to yourself. Well, you got to know yourself to be true to yourself. And do you have a really powerful perspective on who you are behaviorally as a coach? So you could start there. And, and, and then the first co- the first course, the foundations and fundamentals is really going to challenge a coach to think about their own values and their own principles and the foundations and fundamentals on which they're building their life and their and who they are as a coach. And they'll have a chance to think about their own values, their own principles, their own philosophy of coaching, and and how that might compare to some of the key ideas uh, of Coach Wooden. There's a really powerful little module on the difference between character and reputation. Uh, They can learn from the seven-point creed and the two sets of threes. Uh, uh, All of that coming out of the the first course. Uh, And then to learn coach's approach Why did John Wooden uh, create the Pyramid of Success and then try to live on it for nine decades? Because he thought he needed a roadmap behaviorally of high character, high performance, high competent behavior that could guide his thinking. He used the Pyramid of Success every day to think about his own behavior and to try to shape the behaviors of others they coached. I don't think coaches today are spending nearly enough time thinking about their thinking or thinking about their behavior. You know, as an example, really in our world today, could we have two division one basketball coaches getting in a fist fight after a game? What happened there? Well, I'll tell you what happened. They both fell off the pyramid of success and lost their self-control block. Yeah, right? absolutely, that, absolutely. Yeah, yeah that, that, would, that, that would never happen with a coach who was immersed in understanding his behavior from the standpoint of Coach Wooden's pyramid and was mindful. You know, we talk about mindset and being mindful. Well, th- those are great phrases, but what are you mindful of, right? W- what is the blueprint you have in your head and in your day-to-day behavior that's going to keep you on track and keep you from doing stupid things like that? Man, if, if you've got a sense of the self-control block in your life and, and how you need to ke- keep yourself under control, why? Uh, because it's so fundamental to how you think about things, and it's so fundamental to the second part of your coaching, which is the example you set every day, right? Um, so, you know, th- those are the thing. And so that second course, what the coach can learn from the Pyramid of Success course will absolutely transform their day-to-day thinking when it comes to their behavior as a coach. The simple principle of industriousness on the Pyramid of Success that says, Coach Wooden's powerful phrase, no activity without achievement. (laughs) Coaches work their butts off, but they spend most of their time doing a lot of things that aren't getting them anywhere. And each of those blocks has principles and ideas that they can learn that will help them do a much better job of managing and guiding and, and directing their own behavior, let alone having the responsibility for shaping the behavior of others, right? Um, and think there's really a lot to learn uh, for for a coach. Uh, and, and this applies whether it's coaches or applies to an executive, a CEO of a company. I'm working every day with, uh, with leaders of corporations who have large teams and big budgets and responsibilities. And it, they've got the same challenge these days, right? N- nobody, nobody wants to be bossed or led or supervised or managed anymore, but they will be coached. The question is, can you do that? And you can't do it if you can't effectively coach yourself. 
So understanding what, you know, do you have a model for your coaching? It isn't just about how good you are at the X, X and O's, but how good are you at the life skills side? How good are you at your thinking? How good are you at shaping and directing and guiding behavior? You know, how, how good are you at resolving conflict? How good are you at, at the communications and sk skills it takes to really be an effective coach and communicator? That was, you know, part of the brilliance of, of Coach Wood. And then, you know, some of these very simple and powerful principles Coach Wooden had for, for organizing teams, uh, his six-step process for building teams, and uh, teachable points of view on things like team spirit uh, and, and team and teamwork itself. But people talk about teams, but they can't define it. They talk about teamwork. No one when they see it, but they can't define it and teach it. Uh, and, and, and that's part of what the course has. We've We've codified, if you will, and documented from Wooden's brain and his life and all his writings and, and put down what those things are and, and a way for a coach to really develop perspective on, on the most important things that will make them successful, both as a coach and in life. As they're going through the course and they're going through and learning some of these principles or reviewing some of these principles and in different cases, what type of learning structure is there for someone? Let's say that they have even maybe they have a particular area that they're trying to work on. So when you think about, okay, here I am, I'm looking at the foundation and I'm trying to decide and figure out, okay, there, there's, let's say I'm trying to work on cooperation, for example. So maybe I, I, I like to work really hard, but maybe I don't do a good job of, I'm a high school coach, maybe I don't do a good job of cooperating with coaches of other sports to help my athletes to play more than one sport. Or maybe there's something else in my life that is impacting me in that cooperation. So if I'm trying to improve, again, this is just an, as an example, what, what, does that look, what does that look like when I'm trying to, to learn how to be better at cooperation inside of the course? What does that look like? Good question. Uh, one, uh, the opportunity that we have inside of a course, whether, uh, I mean, I might be teaching the course one-on-one, -on -one, and I am doing that these days, actually doing virtual coaching with one hour and 90-minute and, and coaching sessions uh, take over a 15-week period, taking a coach or an athletic director through this entire curriculum for the opportunity to become a certified wooden way coach. Uh, so in a conversation, as an example, we've got uh, lessons on the block of cooperation in two or three places in the course, starting with the assessment. Um, and we, we also have it, uh, you know, as we, as we teach uh, the pyramid uh, itself, and then how cooperation plays out for you as a coach working with people and, uh, you know, uh, developing cooperation uh, within a team. But if you look practically, Mike, at Coach Wooden's definition of cooperation, uh, the fact that it needs to be done with all levels uh, of your life, your relationships, and your coworkers. Uh, what that says is you, you really don't have an option. Uh, you know, it's just say, well, geez, I don't want to cooperate with my other coach because he wants this kid to play his sport in addition to playing my sport. Why should I be interested in talking to the guy? Uh, that, that, isn't, that isn't even a possibility, right? If you're going to be the kind of human being that's considerate of others. If you're a team player when it comes to your school, right? If you really are as interested in the success of others as you are in your own success, many of the lessons Wooden teaches, then you'd buy into that principle to start with. And then a second idea, listen if you want to be heard. The question is how much cooperation are you getting in your life? The question is who's listening to you and what are they learning from you in terms of assessing your ability to listen? And, and then this other important idea, be more interested in finding the best way than in having your own way. Uh, th th that's really the crux of cooperation in it, isn't it? Most of us are, are focused on ultimately wanting it to have it our way. And we're a lot more interested in getting our way. And, and that's really what drives our approach to cooperation. Uh, yeah, we cooperate to the level that it enables us to achieve our end objectives, but what about the other half of the party, right? 
and what they're trying to accomplish and what's important and what's the bigger picture and all those kinds of ideas. So, you know, we, we take this very fundamental definition of cooperation and and talk through that and and analyze it and, and go into even to some, you know, some, some role plays and some discussions of conversations I've had or situations where I haven't gotten any cooperation or, you know, you could you could look at the challenge that coaches have with parents today under the banner of the cooperation plot. For sure. You know, why are why are parents why are coaches having such difficulty, right, with parents these days? Well, most of the answers to that are on, on the block on John Wooden's cooperation block. Nobody wants to listen to each other and everybody's <laughs> only interested in having their own way and not interested in anybody other's way. Dad's way is, hey, my kid's a starter. He's a star. How come you're not playing him? How come you're not featuring him? You know, the, the, so uh, how are two people going to co uh, cooperate when they're so far apart in their thinking and their ability to listen to each other? I mean, there, there's just an example how you might take a single block and apply it. Uh, and, man, we see this uh, across schools, uh, you know, across corporations, within our families, right? I mean, these things apply as much to the, uh, I like to talk about trying to make the home team the strong team, right? I, I think that's our first responsibility as a coach, being a coach of our own life, to try to make our home team the strong team and to go from there. And if you get that right, I think you got a much better chance of getting a lot of other things right. And uh, that was sure a priority with coach. I think wouldn't, I think he was often asked, I think the phrase or the phrase was, coach, do you coach your family like you coach your team? And his answer was, no, I, I try to coach my team like I coach my family. That's well said. So every one of these blocks have very practical application, Mike, to the challenges we have every day as a parent, as a dad, as a husband. Uh, I, I went through divorce in my life and uh, John Wooden has really helped me and the Pyramid of Success has really helped me be, be an honest, faithful, loving husband for the last 26 years, something I wasn't capable of before I met him. I love the idea of being able to work on yourself and then work on leading others after you work on yourself. And obviously we're all works in progress and it's it's a never ending journey to continue to work on yourself and grow and improve and learn and just some of the lessons that we've talked about here from Coach Wooden of being a lifelong learner certainly apply. But you really have to, as you said, get yourself together, get your house in order. And then once you could do that, you could be much more in a position to lead others when you've worked on yourself first. And I think that you've done a really good job of describing how that can happen and going through those examples of just one block on the pyramid of success cooperation and just how the course can lay that out and help coaches in each one of those areas that are so fundamental to the pyramid of success. You mentioned very early in our conversation tonight about how the pyramid of success can impact schools and some of the challenges that we face with our young people that we as coaches and teachers that we have to get up in front of every single day and teach math or teach physical education or try to coach them up on the basketball court or the baseball field or wherever it may be. So when you think about the impact that the courses could have for schools. Talk a little bit about what you guys are doing to get these messages, to get this course in front of school districts, teachers, and ultimately students so you can have the impact that you'd like to have. It's, it's a great question. Uh, Mike, I hope I live long enough to see it happen in some significant way in some significant schools. It's the, it's the, uh, it, it, it's a goal of my life. I had a conversation today, uh, nearly an hour and a half conversation with the superintendent of schools, um, and 
we talked about exactly those those kinds of things. Um, I, I had we start we started out our conversation actually with a biblical reference to one of Coach Wooden's uh, favorite verses, and it's in the book of Matthew. Uh, the idea that a house that stands on a hill cannot be hidden, and that you can be a light in a dark world, uh, and. Uh, and that, that there is an opportunity at some point for somebody to, people to begin to take a stand around the values and principles that, can, that should be guiding and shaping our lives, our schools, and the day-to-day -day behavior of our children and who we are as people and the kinds of families that we're part of. And you, you know, and I know how so much of that is deteriorating and how challenging it is for schools today just to keep a lid on things, uh, let alone uh, the superintendent schools today. I, I, I really was thunderstruck. Uh, we were talking about the biggest challenge as he saw with kids. And one of the things he said, well, I think one of the biggest challenges they have is coping. Coping. Uh, essentially, what he's saying was coping with all of the things, the problems, the challenges, the world that it's thrown at them, and what it means to grow. You know, that idea to keep to keep their minds away from things like uh, ending their own life. You know, he, he talked about the incredible, you know, percentage of uh, what was his phrase, uh, uh, suicidal mentality or something like that. The number of kids that had suicide on their mind and how they were. That idea that they just can't quite cope with the life that they have, right? They they can't get all the things that they see as fast as they want them. Uh, they aren't in love to the level that they want to be loved. They aren't. They don't feel respected. They don't feel appreciated. They don't feel like they're on a track to go anywhere. Uh, they got all of the you know all of the things that we went through growing up, plus all of the things now that are part of us and incredible media generation and the instant gratification and uh, you know I, I, I'm going to be a I'm going to be a million dollar brand by the time I'm an 18 year old athlete and I'll have millions of people paying attention to me and, and want to buy goods and products because my name is on it and I'm going to accomplish that by the time I'm 18 years old. Uh, pretty hard to, to teach team spirit and humility uh, and, uh, and, and, and team play and teamwork. When, when everybody's thinking they're a, they're a corporation in the making or a brand in the building. Um, so th we had a really interesting conversation about the difference between coping, which he was describing, and what I thought was, was the idea of what Coach Wooden was all about, which, which isn't about coping. It, it was really about trying to be the very best version of who you could be. I'm not just... You know, it starts with coping, but there, man, we've got to get to another level of positivity and possibilities and and, and discipline and, uh, you know, a joy of learning and a sense of possibilities and all the things that are represented by Coach Wooden's pyramid. You know, when you go to the top of the pyramid, he has something called competitive greatness. And, and he has a transformational idea in the in the competitive greatness block because it isn't being better than anybody. His definition of competitive greatness is the enjoyment of a difficult challenge and being your best when your best is needed. Those are two things, honestly, Lynn, that when I think about the challenges that I face in my school every single day, and I read those two sentences, if I could get my students to internalize those two things and take them to heart and really try to live to those two principles, it would solve a tremendous amount of challenges that I face on a daily basis. I think when I read enjoyment of a difficult challenge, I think of the number of kids that when things are easy, they're right there. They're with you. And when things get a little bit difficult, there's a lot of kids, unfortunately, in today's world that they shut down. And I think that any of us who 
as adults continue to be lifelong learners, I think that one of the things that, you know, I know I try to share with my children is that if something is difficult, that a lot of times what's on the other side of that difficulty is some of the best things that you can have. When that challenge is in front of you, overcoming that challenge then allows you to get to that other side where there's even greater reward waiting for you. And the process of going through and solving that challenge is is something that I wish I could get all kids to be able to embrace that and understand that the things that they might want, the outcomes like we talked about earlier that they might want are a result of what is their process. And if your process doesn't involve enjoying and embracing difficult challenges, then you're probably not going to get very many of the outcomes that you want, unfortunately. Yeah. You know, and that's, uh, Mike, that's really the beauty of the pyramid is you're saying that I can almost picture a classroom and I can picture you having a discussion with a group of students and I can see your classroom and in the classroom is a very large pyramid of success wall graphic. You maybe even have, uh, the blocks, you know, in various uh, various shapes uh, around your class. And you've been talking about this. Uh, you talk about it a little bit every day. And it's this frame of behavioral reference that you have that you continually have a chance to teach from. And when you're able to talk to them about competitive greatness, it's because all of the other, the way Coach Wooden built the pyramid of success is it it works from the bottom up from the cornerstones in and everything leads to that idea you just can't go to competitive greatness and say well I, i'm going to teach people to enjoy a difficult challenge and understand being their best well how do you do that well that's what the pyramid is about how do you do that well if you teach kids to work hard and you teach them and show them to work on the things that matter if you help them understand being able to be enthusiastic and to have quality relationships and how everybody needs to be loyal to someone and some things. And oh, by the way, it really helps to cooperate as we learn and, and get along, right? It's, it's to be part of a group, you gotta get along and you gotta be under control and the opportunity to be alert and take initiative and not be afraid to fail and the opportunity to set goals and complete those. and. Oh, by the way, you need to be in condition, you need to have skills, and you need to be a team player. And if you have an opportunity to just be yourself, all of those things are going to give you some level of confidence that is going to enable you to understand what competitive greatness is really all about and have a chance to actually accomplish it. So you, you just can't take that block and say, wow, if I can only get my kids to be competitively great, well, the behaviors that make them competitively great as coach defined it are all the other things that's on the pyramid of success. And, and oh, by the way, on that same pyramid, there is on the left side of the pyramid, all the things that they need to give them the spirit, that inside spirit, the ambition, being adaptable and flexible, being resourceful, having the fight that they need to work through these things. And oh, by the way, on the other side, right? The character program they're looking for. How do we get kids to be sincere and honest and reliable and to understand integrity? Those are all of the things that lead that spirit and that, that character molds all of those other behaviors and takes you to that place where you have an opportunity to really understand competitive greatness. So, you know, you have a, a, a situation with a student and they've gone through a difficult time and Oh, what, what do you say? Well, that's not, well, man, what an opportunity for competitive greatness we're going to have today, right? This is not going to be easy, but we're going to go after this. This is going to be fun, right? Uh, and we're going to enjoy this difficult challenge. Oh, by the way, we can work through the difficulty and we can talk about what we learned and what the difficult things were and how, how we may have thought we failed, but the, how we were able to grow through those things. You know, th that that's really sort of the essence of teaching the pyramid and bringing it alive into the day-to-day -day discussions and day-to-day -day culture to make the behavior really part of the mindset that you're, you're wanting people to think about behavior every day. That, that's one of the best things they can be thinking about. 
the behavior it takes to be their best and accomplish things. And we don't do it. We jump in and try to do things. If they go well, oh, great. If they don't go so well, we're depressed. I hate myself. I'm going to shoot myself. My dad hates me. I can't get, you know, all of the things that we default to because we don't understand the behavioral dimensions of all of that happening. That's the reason it's a pyramid, right? Because that's, you have that's to build reason. you have to build upon that base. If you try to skip steps, if you try to short circuit the process like we've been talking about, then your odds of having success at a higher level are next to nothing if you don't take care of that foundational level and then the second tier and so on. You have to make sure that each of those things are in place and I think Anybody who's a teacher, if you just read through and look at the pyramid of success and you think about what Coach Wood meant for each one of those and you think about how could you instill that into your students or you try to envision what a perfect school system might look like or what you would hope that you could pass along as a teacher beyond maybe your subject area if you're teaching math or social studies, you're you're hoping that you can teach some of these values and virtues that Coach Wooden made so important as part of the pyramid of success. And I know that I have one that hangs above my desk at school. I don't have one in my gym just because I don't really have anything that hangs in my gym because stuff doesn't stick to, stuff doesn't stick to the walls, unfortunately. But <laughs> I do I do have one. I do I would love to have I would love to have a giant fifteen by fifteen poster of the of the pyramid of success but i do have one that sits above my desk i i, I can i can build that for you that's actually one of the I, we have a contract with the fathead people so we oh nice build, oh you got it you got a fat yeah. you got a you got a pyramid of success fathead nice yeah well and, and we build custom versions of them we've done it for a gotcha. number of schools uh okay uh Co kobe bryant's high school and uh you know there's what i could rancho christian where my son uh, went to high school Okay. Uh, where the Mobley boy, where the Mobley boys played basketball the last uh, few years, uh, we've done a, a number of custom pyramids for schools. Uh, the teacher, I, uh, the superintendent, I was talking about today, uh, he, he'd like to. He, that's definitely one. You've got to get it as a visible image. Uh, having a, a small pyramid in every kid's locker when he opens his locker, and on the inside of the locker, he sees the pyramid of success, and they're thinking about those behaviors every day. You know, a kid does something wrong and you have a, a conversation with him that might involve discipline. You know, can you can you go to the behavior? Hey, Jimmy, what happened today? Uh, I'm sorry, coach. I, I lost my self-control. Right. It wasn't. Hey, I punched this kid out. Well, why right. did you punch him out? Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I lost my self-control. Well, why did you lose? You know, you can go. It, it's an incredible template for constructively administering discipline because you could point to the specifics that causes the problem. Yeah, absolutely. I love, I think one of the things that I always find to be interesting in our conversations with coaches is we've talked a lot, Lynn, about culture and how coaches try to go about building their culture. And one of the things that inevitably gets discussed is the fact that you can't just have words on a poster you have to have those words, those values connected to behaviors. So, for example, if we're thinking about the pyramid of success, and let's just stick with self-control, right? I can say that I want self-control to be part of my classroom. Well, that's great. And a kid could come in there and they could read it every day. But if they don't connect self-control to a behavior. So, I could say to them, self-control is when you're walking in a line and the kid behind you isn't paying attention and they bump into you. Now, you could turn around and punch them in the head or you could turn around or say something nasty to them or you could turn around and push them. Or a behavior that demonstrates self-control is you could just ignore the fact that they bumped into you or you could turn around and just say, excuse me, or you could say, hey, don't worry about it. You could role play lots of different types of behaviors that you would like that student to exhibit. And I think tying, as you said, a behavior to those different characteristics to me is what makes it powerful. Yes. Yes. 
Yeah, and, and and them having an understanding of just these these basic like a self control, you know, where it involves, um, you know, the idea of self self discipline mentally uh, and, and physically, and it involves good judgment and it involves common sense, and you, you know, you just get you, you 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 can begin to understand how important self control is when you begin to understand what it is and why why it's so so important, uh, and. So, you know, th this is to some degree, uh, you know, there was a, a book out a long time of seven habits of highly effective people. Seven habits sometimes seems a lot for people to get to. Well, 25 behaviors on John Wood's pyramid may seem even more complicated, uh, but uh, he got it right. And as I said, I've been looking at this diagram now for over 20 years, and it's a, it, it's, it's a PhD class in human behavior and human performance. And, you can learn so much about yourself and so much about others and so much about group dynamics and why people do and don't do things. And uh, it, it's really fascinating uh, from a learning standpoint um, to, uh, to be a student of the pyramid of success. Absolutely. I could not agree more. We are coming up, Lynn, here close to an hour and a half. What I want to do is give you an opportunity to let people know where they can find out more about the course where do they need to go, share how they can reach out to you to find out more about it. And then after you do that, I'll jump back in and wrap things up. Yeah, uh, well, I appreciate that, Mike. Yeah, we have uh, the information uh, about the John R. Wooden course is on a, a website, uh, www.thejohnrwoodencourse.com. Uh, there's all kinds of information there on our products and uh, the, the courses and the tools and the assessment, uh, our, our basic philosophy on things and how you can get involved uh, in taking a course individually or in becoming a certified coach. Maybe you're interested in teaching this. I've got a number of athletic directors that are going through the certification so they can begin to get their coaches involved. It's a great process for an athletic director to be involved in and then obviously head coaches working with assistant coaches. So there's individual courses you can take and individual tools you can buy, or you can go through a complete uh, certification process and become a, you know, a, a coach yourself of these things. And, and we've got a, a number of people now that are uh, doing that. And um, my uh, email address, um, my initials LG, at jrwc.com, the John R. Wooden course.com. That's where uh, you can get a hold of me. I'd be happy to, you know, publish my uh, my cell phone as well. I'm available day or night <laughs> to talk about these things and to work with with coaches and business leaders and families and groups. Uh, and you know, I, I do do keynote speaking. I'm available to come out and do in-service teaching groups and, and things like that, work with coaches or groups of, of teachers and students. Uh, we do all of that all the time and, and love, now that the world's opening up a little bit, we can come, come back out and, and go live. Um, so that's probably the, the best way. And also I, I might put in a plug, we've got a brand new book out called Coach Em Way Up, Five Lessons for Leading the John Wooden Way. Uh, there's information there on the assessment in the book and an awful lot of information about this five-part coaching process I'm talking uh, to you about. And it also shares some of our own life story. My partner uh, that I wrote the book with, my business partner in the John R. Wooden course, and what our experience has been and how it's been part of the, the transformation of our own lives. And uh, particularly him, he started as a client uh, and then became my business partner, and he's been using the John R. Wooden course in his, in his company uh, for the last three years at a very high level. Fantastic, Lynn. We will have all that in the show notes when the episode is live so that people can find that, find all the links, find the course, find the book, and find out more about what you've been able to do and build with the John R. Wooden course I cannot thank you enough. I cannot t thank our mutual friend, Tim Gallagher, enough for <laughs> connecting us uh, to be able to put us together so that we could do the podcast tonight. Again, thank you for your time. 
truly appreciative. And to everyone out there who is a part of our audience, thanks for listening. And we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Hoop Heads podcast presented by Head Start Basketball.